a thousand members. We've got a 95% retention rate. The fact that you've moved to Ireland, relocated your family and the business is still running successfully is a testament to your hard work. In this episode, we're joined by Gareth Allen, owner of Studio 23. Now, Gareth has gone from having a single one-to-one -one PT studio to expand into semi-private and actually expand in his space to having two locations right next to each other. Fitness is a game that you have to play. You have to keep playing. You never win. You have to keep winning. He's also bought the premises that he operates his business in. We asked for a 10-year lease. The owner just said, well, is there any chance you might want to buy it? But we jump on that opportunity. And in this episode, we cover exactly how he's done all of it, how he's built the systems in his business so he can leave the country and still operate it successfully. Go out and get some help as early as possible. An accountant will do your accounts a thousand times faster and better than, than you will. And same as marketing and maybe the same as leadership or, or understanding how to run a business. And how he's built a business and a lifestyle that gives him time and money. I don't want to run my business like that. That won't be good for my family and, and they're, they're, they're my drive. We hope you enjoy the episode. Gareth, welcome to the podcast studio. Question number one, why did you get into the industry and why are you still here? That's a great question, Charlie. Um, I got into the industry through a passion of my own personal sport. I was always super active. Uh, was probably never really good at any one sport, but was uh, always enjoyed every, every, every time I could get to go and do some sport, I wanted to do that. Um, I didn't do particularly well with my A-levels, but my, um, my sister actually is reasonably intellectual and was at uni, so it seemed like a, a path maybe I should follow. I managed to get enough uh, to get in to do a degree in sports science, which seemed like the natural progression. And actually I did really well there. Once I got into learning that I really wanted to learn about, um, I did quite well. And the fit, so, so that, that was just a, a passion out of from, from fitness. I actually came back from the university and wasn't really, wasn't actually qualified for the, what is the fitness industry, even though um, I had a degree level. And uh, so just started at the bottom with the, the fitness job. Realized just, you know, helping people was something that, that I quite enjoyed. And that grew, in, grew, grew into just switching some of the degree work into the personal training. Um, and then beyond then, obviously, to, to now running my own business. So I think it's just a passion for sport has now turned into a passion for other people's health and fitness. I really struggle to understand why people don't want to do fitness because it is ingrained in what I do and how I behave from a child. So I, I crave the wanting to go work out, whether the workout's useful or not. I really crave that. And I want other people to have that relationship with exercise. Bring everyone who's either watching this or listening to this up to speed. Uh, what's the business you have now, business model, uh, team? Uh, I was at your facility about two years ago. So we will flash up some footage of that facility on YouTube. But if you could just tell everyone the inner workings of the business right now. Sure. So... Right now, we have uh, two less than a thousand foot shops, essentially, uh, where we do one on one personal training and we do semi private personal training on uh, any other shop. I've got uh, four full time employees. Um, one of them is a manager, uh, and I've got maybe two part time team members that are, we're looking to grow into full time. We're not far off 150 members across the personal training and semi-private PT. And from what you've explained and from what when when you turn, uh, turned up to see us, that was when we just moved into next door, having been running personal training for, for a long time and, and realizing that the margin and the opportunity to help more people at a better price point was in the semi-private PT. So you're quite unique. Um, if you can just tell everyone where you're based and then just describe, you said shop, mm. and it is literally that so if you could just describe it and again we'll do our best to flash up some footage sure so uh it's a little sleepy little suburb between southampton and winchester um it's reasonably affluent uh area there's a an old what would have been an old shopping uh i had to describe it would have been a very old shopping precinct like i think 70s 80s they've all got uh, with flats above um it's almost a little bit run down they built a whole new arcade like half a mile away down down the street um, but for us, it was um, cost effective rent, loads of free parking. Um, and, and with the convenience of where we are for our members is a real key element. It, there's, there wasn't anything in our area that, that wasn't a 15, 20 minute drive away. And now they've got something five minutes from their door. And you're in a unique position because you made the decision early on to buy 
uh, the premises. Is mm. that right? Yeah, that is. Yeah. So um, it was an opportunity that I didn't know how good it was at the time, and uh, but realized it could be really good for the, for for the long game of the business, the security over a lease. Um, and fortunately, was able to uh, you know gather a small deposit and put that towards it, um, and I have that that'll be paid off fairly soon. And, you know, it's not huge. It is only a small shop, not a great value. Um, but it is, certainly is a value that maybe we could lend against in the future and help to grow the business. Um, but the, the one thing it does, it gives me the security of, of knowing that we've got that space. Well, I've heard, I've heard horror stories of people that move into a lease and then um, two weeks later they've been um, kicked out by the landlord and they've had to close shop after kitting it out and getting everything ready. Um, so to be in that position, just have that security and know that... Um, from that perspective, you're you're safe and you're in a good spot. is 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 a, re- is a really reassuring one. It's more the fact that you're now a commercial property Oops. owner, and that's the first takeaway I want everyone to get from this podcast with you today, Gareth. Is uh, I can't remember the exact terminology you used if you stumbled into buying the premises. We asked for a ten year lease, and just the 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 owner just said, "Oh, is there any chance you might want to buy it?" So just the right timing for for him, the right timing uh, for me. Um, and uh, thought we'd jump on that opportunity, mainly then for security, but essentially now it's become an investment. Roughly how uh, big square foot is location one, location two? They're right next door to each other. Yeah, they're right next door. I think they're just under a thousand square foot total space with, with a, one's got an office and a little, you know, small changing area, toilet facilities. Because so many times uh, gym owners are paying the mortgage of someone else's property and um, for very small, uh, you know, amount they could actually just buy that property or buy an existing property in their town or city. And, um, you know, which you touched upon it just a second ago, is, you know, you might sign a three-year lease, a five-year lease, a 10-year lease, and be consistently just paying, um, you know, that lease uh, amount to, to the landlord. But it just makes sense to, you know, think bigger. And, uh, you know, if you're going to be in the fitness industry for a long time, which I'm sure everyone who's listening to this or watching this will be, you know, take the leap of faith, you know, get the deposit uh, amount you need and, and start shopping to become a, a commercial commercial property owner. And this is like the the, the, the long, the 10-year the ten journey, or it's probably 12 or, or, or nearly 13 now, of, you know, then the mortgage was close to the rental value, and now it's half what I pay of next door. It would also make um, selling the business, if you ever wanted to do that, much easier, I imagine. No, knowing that there's no lease uh, or, or time limit on that, it's going to make it a much more appealing buy if you ever did want to sell the business. So you've really got an asset there rather than just, yeah, a business with a lease. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, the, the security of it is, again, I did, was fortunate. it's fortunate now. I didn't know perhaps how great that was going to be. But then also it's through your pension as well, right? So there's benefits uh, to that, you know, with your pension and being a commercial property owner. So if you're in the position where you're thinking of buying a, a premises, I know, speak to your accountant because there's tons of uh, benefits involved in terms of you know, corporation discounts and, and so on. And, um, you know, I would love more gym owners to become commercial property owners as well, just like you have, Gareth. And were you happy with where the business was? Obviously you were because you went and actually bought the building, but um, did you have to be confident within the business to be able to buy the building? As in like, we're in a good spot, I want to be here long term and that's why I'm going to make the decision. Because some people, their business may not be at the level to potentially buy the building yet. Or they can't see a future because the business isn't succeeding to the level that they want it to be. Yeah, what, what are the indicators you would look for in terms of going, yep, now that's the time to buy the business? I think that's a then and now question. Um, then it was, I had the confidence and wanted to have the security. So had the offer of the 10 year lease meant that we, we I was ready to commit and I wanted the, the, the clo- you know, that's as close as all in you can get in terms of a, a commercial rental. Um, I think it's it's going back to like knowing your numbers. You really need to to dial in and know you know what's what has the true potential of that studio got, which I always knew the potential of that, and then just just work worked hard to slowly chip away and 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 try to achieve that. In my eyes, you are a definition of a true business owner. So many people will say they're an entrepreneur or they're a business owner, but the reality is they've got a job inside of their own business, which is paying them low money and there's no freedom and they're stuck for time 
uh, and you know, all the problems that come with that. But you are in a very unique position. So not only do you actually physically own the building uh, where your business operates from, you've got the team as well, you've got the systems, you know your numbers, but you recently made the decision to uh, leave England and uh, move to Ireland and the business is operational uh, still. So first of all, hats off because uh, you know not many people get to that level. So for everyone watching or listening, can you just explain the living situation uh, you have right now, uh, the operations of the business and how you're able to you know, not live in the same country? I think I kind of, kind of want to go back to the start of I've been in all of the positions that you just talked about of, you know, I created a job for, for myself or you might have heard the phrase of, you know, I quit my nine to five to work 24 seven. You know, I've, I've been there, I've been in the trenches uh, doing the coaching. I don't actually know how I had time to know the numbers or, or I didn't until, uh, you know, until some of your help. Um, so I, I don't know how tricky it is to, it's not easy to get away from that when it is your own business. It feels like you're, you know, it, it's your baby. Everybody, you feel like it relies upon you solely to operate. But I think I always had, the dream of trying to run it more as a business than, than being a coach. And as I've, I've aged and I've got other priorities now, I've got a young family, I've got three children. Uh, I, uh, the ultimate for me is to have time and money and not very many people I see achieve that. I see it. I see and I've trained a lot of wealthy people. They don't have time, but they have money. And the people that we don't get to train typically have time, but they necessarily don't have the money to, to be able to join our, we are, we are a relatively high end facility. Um, so I wanted to create time and money and we've done that through, um, you know, for you, I would say you guys have helped me achieve that by uh, accelerating our marketing, by enabling us to onboard new members that took the ability to go coaching beyond myself and a another person into a team of people. So I think the but marketing um, obviously was a big help, but that wasn't the only thing because when you first came to FMA, it was just one-to-one -one at the start. And then when you went and visited Gareth, was that when you floated the idea of transitioning I think the model? Started to transition, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so marketing was one thing, getting people through the door. But there was, I think there was definitely other things around the business that needed to be addressed or built or implemented before you could live the lifestyle that you do now. If it was just marketing on its own and none of the other systems or foundations were addressed, it would probably be a little bit of a different story. So let's say that. I am. I own a facility. I'm working in it 12 hours a day. I'm coaching. I'm doing the sales. I'm doing the marketing. I'm doing kind of everything. Spin all the plates. What would be, let's say, the step by step process to get myself to a point to get out of that and be able to be out of the business and enjoy my time and enjoy the finances of that business as well? I think it's like a. It would be. I would like staged growth. So. If you're doing 40 hours a week of delivery and you're spinning all of the plates, you need to go to 30 hours and have someone do it, come and do 10 hours. Then it's in uh, and repeat that process until you can eliminate yourself from the role that, that you have. You know, but my role has changed. I'm now doing the sales and marketing role and I can do that remotely. Hence, so if I bring that back to the to, to moving to Ireland, operationally, it's all run how I want it to be. Uh, I've got a manager in place who is checking on that and I've created the systems for him to manage that successfully. But it's all been, you know, I've done the managing correctly of a team and then I've been able to offload that responsibility to somebody else. So essentially you've kind of mastered the task and then delegated. So the first one would have been coaching. You were doing all of that coaching and then you needed to focus on other areas to grow the business. So you reduce those hours, pass that task on to someone else. Then you could implement that time and energy to the new thing that you had to learn, which would have been marketing and sales, and then, or it could have been um, like managing a team, or managing a team, or being a better leader. Or you know, there's there's so many facets to being a small business owner that uh, all those elements come into play at the same time. But it's just having a new focus and moving it to to moving the needle to the next stage. Um, and I think that's really important because we said this off the podcast. You know that transition from going to a personal trainer, it seems natural to go to gym owner. But most people just think, oh, I'm just personal training in my own gym. But completely different story, isn't it? They're, they're two different roles. Like, And as a 23-year-old, I wasn't bothered about any of those things. But again, I said about different responsibilities, different motivations now. Um, as a 36-year-old, if I want to achieve the lifestyle that I want to, I've got to think of it as a small business owner and not a personal trainer. And if I was in that situation that uh, I was in, you know, in, in the journey of you know, 10, 8, Seven, six, five years ago, um, and I didn't try and recognise the opportunity beyond what I was doing. 
then I wouldn't be where I, where I am now. I think it's takeaway number two for me so far is having the vision of creating that life that you want. So the 23 year old Gareth versus the 36 year old Gareth, your needs and wants uh, completely two, two changed because you have three, how old are your three children? Uh, seven, five and one and a half. So like, you know, you don't want to be that business owner or personal trainer that is missing every bath time, bedtime, is missing the school runs, missing sports day. The hours of a PT, early mornings, late evenings, the kids are in school all day, you'd never see them. So there's so many business owners who are in their gyms right now who are working, you know, nonstop, who don't have the systems, don't have the team. And it's so important to have that vision of like, hey, look, stop for a second. You can't keep doing this. You can't keep spinning all of these plates at once. You need to think bigger. You need to have a vision for yourself. And same as a weight loss client, you, you said it already, um, you know, gradually, um, you know, like reduce your growth. hours. Yeah. You know, same with a weight loss client. You wouldn't just expect them to lose the five stone in a week. Same as a business owner. Don't have the expectations that you're going to drop all your hours immediately. And then suddenly, you know, be a, a full time business owner like yourself. And, and all those hours and being in the trenches are essential because you do have to work hard to get the business where it needs to be. But I think the question you need to ask yourself is, why am I doing this? Where is it going? So many people spin plates and work long shifts, but don't actually, they're not moving in a certain direction. There's no trajectory to a better place. They're just doing it and maintaining in the same position. Whereas with you, you knew where you wanted to go and knew why you were working all these hours and knew exactly why you were delegating the hours and getting outside the business. And you actually just knew the destination that you wanted to go in you the just, first place. You end up doing for doing sake. Yeah. And it's it's really easy to say that now. And it's really hard to, it, and it has been hard. You know, this hasn't come overnight, right? It's a, it's a 12 year journey. And that, and there's a long way to go. There, there's so much more that I can do within the relatively small space. You know, I haven't got a, Hundred ten thousand square foot facility that uh, that that I don't need any of that to be able to achieve the lifestyle that that I want. And I think what's really important as well is that you delegated these job roles, and there's a reason you did that. But some people, and I think you mentioned it, delegate too quickly. For some people that don't necessarily put the work required to master a certain role within the business before they delegate, maybe that's because they don't like it. Maybe they delegate the marketing about really understanding what's going on. They delegate the sales about really understanding how to make sales. And because of that, nothing actually happens. And then they don't understand how to fix that problem themselves. So there's definitely finding that kind of finite balance between delegating but doing it within the right time to be able to make sure that the systems are built out correctly rather than just left to see what happens. 100% and none of none of what I'm doing is perfect but having some experience of the different roles that that we now have has enabled me to help Ben the manager now make better decisions I Q&A with him twice a week to make sure that we're going in the right direction there's nothing that needs my attention or if I want to implement a new idea or a new system that you know we talk it out first but I, I've manage the team already so I'm familiar with some of the challenges that are going to come his way and I'm a good sounding board to him to uh, to enable us to, to push the business on. I speak to many gym owners that have aspirations to live abroad. And instead of systematizing their business, just like you have, they think, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll close down my business and I'll go for this new shiny object, which is online coaching. Uh, you decided not to do that. You decided to systematize the business uh, fully. And now you're living in Ireland. So can you just talk through um, what does a day look like now for you? Um, you know, I'm sure you help with the kids in the morning and then what do you do for the remainder of the six, seven, eight hours? Sure thing. So uh, it's relatively new. So it has been an adjustment. I'm not sure that I've got it, uh, you know, the, the sweet spot yet, but, but, but I'm not a million miles away. So what I've got away from is like that because the responsibility isn't on me is like wake up with the panic. Has everybody turned up to work this morning? Are our classes all going? Do I need to rearrange a, a booking or a session? So it's a lot, but there's, so there's, there's no stress in the morning. It's wake up, uh, you know, do do the kids bit, school run or not, depending on whether I've got a call to book in at nine o'clock or if I've got a meeting or something that, that needs to happen. Um, and then it would be uh, uh, work through different, you know, like time schedule, different elements of the day, whether it be a little block for some sales calls, whether it be um, uh, you know, doing a bit of training for you guys or some, some other training that I like to do. Um, is it reading the book or a chapter of the book? And it's just creating that, uh, getting the work done that needs to be done, but it, most of the work that I do now isn't the day-to-day -day operational, the, the, like the the immediates right now. It's thinking about where can we go, what's the next stage, how do we take it to the next level, what what 
do we need to implement to help with the, the team, the the members? Um, what needs to be done to uh, improve the business rather than the day to day running? I feel that's been a massive change, and I think that's going to have an even bigger impact, maybe a bit faster now, because I'm actually I'm physically removed. I can't go and fix the water leak. I can't go and uh, uh, and do the thing. And uh, but the team are very able to, to to do all those things for me and let me know that it's been done and or if it needs my attention. So being the visionary of the business and one of the business books that I read early on and we send it out to all FMA clients is the E-Myth mm. by Michael Gerber. I don't know if you've uh, read it uh, yeah, at all, but um, basically you have followed that book to a T because you don't have to be there to uh, implement the service to then get paid. And there's another uh, great book that I read years ago called The 4-Hour Work Week. Now, I don't know how many hours you are Not working. That, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I've it, also read the book. Yes, but basically you you have the option to work four hours. I'm not saying I'm not a fan of, of only working four hours. Because, no, it's not enough. Yeah, but what I'm trying to get at Principle. is, yeah, you've got the leverage there um, to pick and choose. If I want to do four hours next week, I probably could. We would, the, the, our challenge right now is that we would just stay the same. We would have a slow decline. Our retention's great, but we'd get a slow decline. So I'm not in a position to be able to, you know, take the foot off the gas and, and do the four hour work week. But in principle, you know, why couldn't I have three businesses? Now that I've done some education around running a business and not being being a good personal trainer, that there are two very different roles and responsibilities and two very different set of skills that you need. And the, the, the more that I've learned about that, there's no reason why I couldn't have two businesses that I could dedicate 16 hours each, perhaps. Something you mentioned earlier that I wanted to circle back to was you said that, you know, I don't want to have a 10,000 square foot space. I wanted to do, I wanted to kind of work towards my goal or my ambition. And it'd be great to touch upon that a little bit more because I think so many people in the industry, they grow for the sake of growing without necessarily knowing where they want to go. Whereas I feel with you, it's quite specific. You know exactly what you wanted to do with the business, with your personal life. And it'd be kind of good to touch on what, why do you take that approach rather than just grow, 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 grow. Um, you probably can look into like my social media following for the answer. Like I, I don't mind doing camera. I, I'm quite interested in this whole podcast idea as an experience. Um, but I kind of want to be like the unknown. I want to be, I want to have a, you know, a small space that, that works really well. Um, I want to create a business plan that, that works and maybe then we could look at maybe doing another site that, that, that works, but doing it off our own money rather than borrowed money. You mean you don't want to be a social media fitness influencer? No. <laughs> but you still want to work in the fitness industry? Yeah. Good, because we have a lot of members like that who uh, you know want to be behind the scenes and uh, want to build something significant, but don't want to be the celebrity yeah. Uh, in front of the camera and obviously we do have clients that do that as well 100 percent. um but you know it's different personalities same with fma like i'm not really in front of the camera too much on on the instagram um because of various reasons um, mm. but you can still scale a business is the point and it's not about me it's about it's the bit it's the business yeah and you and you are in front of the camera quite a lot for the marketing side of things and even though you don't like that there's a reason why you are doing it is and it's because you know that that's the thing that will get more leads and customers through the door. You're not doing it because you want to be in front of the camera. You're doing it because it works. And I'm doing it because it works. Yeah, yeah. And, and so many people shy away from that. I've had so many calls with um, with gym owners going, oh, I don't want to get in front of the camera. Um, I don't want to do that. But I just think that you need to do the things that work to get the outcome that you want. And if you're going to shy away from it, then... Yeah, but just to put this into context, it's not getting in front of the camera because the you've got to show doing. your a PB at a front squat, back squat, or take your shirt off to show how athletic you are. It's getting in front of the camera to put a marketing message out to the masses in your local area. to Tell the story about you got Jane or Michelle or, or Wayne or, or, or whatever it is, or give away a hint or a tip. I, lo I, I, I do like the idea of, you know, being a little... Possibly being an authority in the in the industry, or you know, I just want to give out free advice. If they come across our channels and they pick up some free advice that's good and it's honest, then I think that that, that would be great. But do I need to do that to have run a successful business? I don't, I don't, I don't think so. And I think that the the hesitancy that people have going in front of the camera is they worry about what people will think of them. But the people they're worrying about are their peers, are people that they know, they're worried about what they will think of them. Their competitors. Yeah, their competitors, but they're not actually thinking about the customer or the ideal customer. And when you start thinking about what they want rather than what other people that, like your, your peers, what your peers think of you doesn't change your business. We'll pay your mortgage. Yeah, we'll pay the bills. And what I do with my friends is very different to how I talk to my clients, right? So yeah. they're, they're two different 
things. It's, it's not about me. It's about uh, our members in the studio. Um, What's the biggest mistake you've made in your business? The biggest mistake I made is not knowing my numbers and not tracking my finances properly. And there's still significant work to be done to make sure that I'm looking at it like a business owner and not like somebody, as you said before, who's doing sessions and getting paid for them. When when did you realize you'd made that mistake? Was that a while ago? Because I feel like a lot of people don't know their numbers, but they kind of hide behind, well, everything seems okay. But then sometimes that, then something will hit and then you realize, ah, I should have been looking at my numbers. Was there that moment for you? Yeah, for sure. There have been multiple times where I've you know, struggled to pay rent even when it was my own mortgage or you know, uh, tax bills, VAT bills. That it, it, there's been a roller coaster for sure of thinking I've got it all sorted and not having it all sorted then having it all sorted and still getting tripped up or found out because I didn't understand any of it. I didn't do any training on it. I didn't do any, it goes back to the story or the journey. And I, and I still don't, and there's still lo so much more to know to make sure that it doesn't happen again. But I'd like to get into a position where I'd never ever have to worry about those things. So there's hundred percent. I'm pretty sure I reached out to you guys around the time where finances were at their lowest point and, and were a real struggle. And I was really contemplating, you know, what do I do with the business? I either need to stick to the vision and, and, and get some help, which I talked about earlier of, you know, my advice to other people would be like, go out and get some help as early as possible. An accountant will do your accounts a thousand times faster and better than, than you will once they understand you. And same as marketing and maybe the same as leadership or, or understanding how to run a business. I should have looked at this before you came on the podcast. How many years have you been with FME? Before COVID, so yeah. three I was gonna and say, I was maybe say. coming up four-ish. Yeah. And in that time, um, in terms of client numbers, uh, where was it at and where is it now? Yeah, so probably about 60 clients before when we were about to go to 150, which has been a target of mine. I've been, been working away for a while. Um, and the key growth is in that semi-private area. So our PT's probably stayed around the same-ish. Um, uh, uh, and I didn't actually have the second studio until I onboarded with you guys. And then obviously we got the the influx on the momentum campaign, and but we are a slow and steady. Like we don't, I don't need a thousand members. We've got a ninety five percent retention rate, so we just need a slow trickle of this, you know, a small number each month that we can serve really well. We can look after, and we need to try and turn them all into lifetimers. That, that's my ultimate goal. Why would when when you get fit, fitness is a game that you have to play. You have to keep playing. You don't, you never win. You have to keep winning. So I try to teach that. And then the team now teach that, uh, that concept of when you get in good shape, you don't stay in a good shape unless you do the things that you've been doing for the last, well, however long it's taking to get in shape to keep you fit and well. So we, we really have that ethos around the, the gym and the studio. And that's what really helps our attention. We've not touched on pricing uh, what is the pricing for PT and, and semi-private? And then people can do the maths in terms of where you're at. Sure. So uh, semi-private is 209 for two sessions a week and 259 for three sessions a week. Uh, personal training is uh, four sessions a month, 240, eight sessions a month, 460, and 12 sessions a month is 660. Let's go back to the, the finances. So um, what were you doing previous uh, in terms of financial tracking and then what are you doing now? I know you said there's still room for improvement. I think that's the same for any business owner, including myself. Uh, but what I, yeah, tell me the story of the finances. So the finances actually helped through Nikki and FBDA and they've really, and again, this is like reaching out, asking for help. The first problem was marketing. How do I get more members in? Actually, now I've got more money. What do I do with that money? And how do I make sure that I'm, um, in my case was, push more one-on-one -on -one because it's high revenue and I might get another person paying me 660 a month. But that was great when I was the trainer, but it's not great when I've got to pay someone. It's so labor intensive. It needs to not be our, it needs to be a product that we have for the right person, injury specific goal. Um, but so the, so the semi-private model uh, was something that I knew other people were doing. I wasn't that keen on it at the start because I, because I didn't know how to deliver excellent coaching in that small environment. So, um, but the numbers really stack up on it and it, it, it enables us at a lower price point to get more contact time. People need to work out more often rather than less often. And we also fall into a bracket of affordability, although it's not cheap what we do but for our area, you know, 200 pound a month, 250 a month for a good service, you know, pe people will pay. And, and that model to show you the growth, we used to do maybe 
10 semi-private, which started as a group of friends coming, you know, essentially to create a discount in a one-on-one -on -one environment. We now do, we've now got availability for 44 sessions. This episode is brought to you by the Fitness Business Development Academy. Are you running your fitness business or is your fitness business running you? Are you frustrated but with all the effort you're making within your business every single day, at the end of the month, you're still not making as much profit than you'd like to? If so, the FBDA are the guys for you. These are some of the best business coaches within the fitness industry and have personally helped many of our clients here at Fitness Marketing Agency. If you wanna find out how you can go from frustrated and stuck to clear, and have clarity and more profit in your fitness business, these are the guys for you. If you want to find out more and book a free strategy call, all you need to do is go to www.thefbda.com. And was the main um, concern that you weren't able to deliver good coaching in a semi-private environment? Were there any other concerns you had about moving to that model? Because most personal trainers are always skeptical about moving to a semi-private model. They don't think it can work. They think that one-to-one -one is the best possible solution for everyone, essentially. And, you know, we were speaking about, Gab about this with Gavin, where small group can work for most people. There's only really a small percentage of people that may actually need one-to-one. -one, well, if it's be, uh, an athlete, a celebrity, or someone with a... A specific, a, re a really specific goal that, is, that isn't going to... We have a general athletic program, but if they, like, only want to train lower body for, for a reason, then it's not going to work. Or if they can't do... It's some, it, it's, it's unique to the individual and one-on-one -on -one, we find one-on-one -on -one, we almost onboard everyone to semi-private regardless of what they think they want when they come in and then we do an onboarding assessment with everybody and sometimes the coaches will be like they're just not going to be a good fit we've got an injury that sounded okay on the phone but actually it needs to be navigated around or, or fitness levels or confidence we need to make sure we give them and often we're in a position where we actually we gift them a little bit of one-to-one -one and we say, we'll keep your price point low you agree semi-private We'll give you a little bit of one-to-one, -one, give you the confidence, but we want to transition you back in as soon as possible because we know that more, great, more attendance, you know, faster results. We've all had that someone. client that just can't squat their hinge patterns off. They, they've got the shoulder. <laughs> just move like a bag of potatoes. Yeah, That's what we and they probably them, just yeah. need, you know, five, ten sessions of PT. And then We've just done that with a guy, um, Dave Foster, my team will know. Like, he just doesn't, just does, has never moved, never exercised before, moved terribly. So we just gifted him the one-on-one. -on -one. Like, we've, we've just bought a lifetime member. He's so in, it's unbelievable for somebody who who just shouldn't fit and, and doesn't fit and, and isn't ever enthusiastic about exercise. You can, the change in him now is unbelievable. I love that. So you've reduced the rate of one-on-one -on -one PT to get Dave through the movement patterns. So like four months, five months. And then when he was ready, one one-on-one and one semi-private. And then now he's two semi-privates and it's absolutely flying. You'll stick for life because you've taught him new patterns, new behaviors. And he's getting results. I'm sure. He's getting great results. And also, like, he didn't know what he wanted when he came in. And he's really appreciative of the help that we've given him, even though we didn't change his membership price for that. We touched on finance. I want to go back to that. Um, so with the financial tracking you've got in the business right now, you mentioned Nikki from Fitness Business Development Academy and how he's been able to assist and help. Um, how often are you checking the P&L? Uh, what are the profit margins at? and everything to do with finance. So um, again, that goes to the education. They've really helped me understand what a business is. I know you guys have talked for, for a long time about month, scoring it as monthly recurring revenue and really focusing on that um, rather than the front end revenues and creating that stability in your business so that you know in the next two months time or three months time, pretty much roughly what you're gonna be generating as a recurring. And is that going to cover all of your staff bills once your taxes are paid? Is it going to cover all of your expenses? And have you got a little bit left over at, uh, at the bottom? And the FBDA model is that they put what you want as an owner operator into the staff expenses. So rather than being the typical of like you just get what's left, you're working towards a target where you are involved in that target. And then what's left, which is the stage I'm approaching now, is that's actually to be reinvested back into the business. It, it, it's it's proper, it's true profit rather than just just, just your your wages. And that's a bit that um, the, the next stage I'm excited about is then what can we do with that? Do we then look at another studio in a couple of years? Just engineered. If we can build that. To the target that you want personally and then professionally with the business. 100%. And, and, there, and, and that number's in there. So, I'm, so once we, and we've worked hard, the semi-private has really helped to get there quicker to enable me to make sure that I'm getting paid a number that, you know, two or three years ago, I didn't think would ever be able to achieve. And we're starting to create profit off the backup. That will look different on an accountant spreadsheet for sure. Uh, um, but but having that 
owner operation in their staff expenses all of a sudden means you've got to go and work for another two, three, four, five, whatever you want to get paid. Um, because it feels like you haven't achieved it before you start actually measuring the profit. Because so many gym owners will uh, pay everyone else first uh, and then they'll scrape together whatever is left as their salary. And then that can be a massive influx. Or what's even worse, they call themselves a business owner. But in reality, the way that they make their money is they do one-on-one -on -one PT inside of their gym. So we know or we see a lot of gym owners that do semi-private coaching. They have a team of four or five people. On paper, they look like this big shot entrepreneur. But the reality is the way that they get paid is because they've got 15 PT clients that they train two to three times a week, as well as doing the business. And for me, that's not a business owner. So the business might run itself and it's, it's costing them nothing to do. And then when they train their PT, they get their 40, 50, 60 pound and straight into their hand, right? You got it. But, but then if, if you don't go to work, yeah. you don't get paid. Then you and that's Ill. something that I'm trying to or have worked hard to create and continue to... Um, make sure that's a consistent platform um, that you're not you're not relying on yourself. And if you are sick, then you're still going to get paid. Okay, maybe the business won't grow, or you know we'll have a little bit of a, a plateau. But a plateau when your expenses are already in there is way better than getting what's left or having to deliver to pay. That's a start. That should be the start of your journey, rather than a few uh, business financial questions. Uh, what VAT rate are you on? Uh, what uh, booking system do you use? Uh, what merchant account do you use? Who do you bank with? Do you have multiple business bank accounts? Great questions. Um, I'm on the 10% flat rate after a headache with my accountant around getting that sorted out, although that is going to change. So I had to pay 20% for a longer time than I, or I should never have paid it in the first place. But having the confidence and the education around uh, with Nikki and others. to Let's to stop there. So, so many accountants get this terribly wrong. And uh, they're either advising gym owners to pay no VAT or they're advising them to pay extortion at 20 percent. And, um, you know, you have to do your due diligence um, into that accountancy firm um, that you use and they have to fully understand your business. And uh, as you know, Gareth and, and people listening or watching this, you know, as a gym owner, you don't have many VATable expenses. Um, that you can claim the VAT back on. So um, I'm sure that it was a winding path to get to where <laughs> yeah, you're at. 100%, yeah. um, but that's a major takeaway. Get a new accountant, like getting a new coach, right? Um, some, some, somebody will do what you think is right or tell you otherwise. And I had that headache for a while and it cost me a lot, it has cost me a lot of money. It was probably around the time where I was, uh, you know, uh, struggling financially, I was paying way too much of VAT. That's going to change as our revenue is now sitting right on the edge. And I'm, But, but I, I've known that that's coming and I've, Create, you know, all of my expenses right now on my spreadsheet is set up as if 20% of that. So there's actually a 10% saving right now that I'm not accounting for until I get my end of year accounts. You know, something just popped into my head. Another thing I've seen that gym owners do is they have their uh, business um, that's under the VAT threshold and then they start another business, which is their personal training business, which is where all their income and then suddenly they've got two P&Ls and it's a complete mismatch. And then all of their staff are actually contractors and not on payroll. So really on paper, uh, on Instagram, it might look like you're this big baller with this massive gym and everything's flying. But uh, if you was to get investigated, uh, you're probably breaking some HR rules. Uh, you're definitely breaking some VAT rules, tax rules. And uh, it isn't this uh, all singing, all dancing business that you think you have, um, which you have and, and you have created because you've done everything right. And that's the minefield of when you're doing the sessions, when you're, and I don't, as I don't understand it entirely because I'm not an accountant, but I'm learning more about it to make sure that we don't get tripped up again in the future or that we're making the best decisions to make sure that the business is secure. Um, another thing I'm trying to work on is, you know, I want a war chest because COVID was horrible. I never want to go through that ever again. Wouldn't it be great if we could get into a position where you've got six months of your staff salaries in the bank ready to go, 12 months of your expenses or, so, or, or whatever that thing might be for you. But wouldn't that be a, a fantastic position to be in rather than where I have been of like, oh, well, we made a couple of thousand pounds profit. Well, that's mine because I need to spend it to on on life. I don't want to run my business like that. That won't be good for my family. And, and they're, they're, they're my that's my main drive. Um, let's talk about the merchant account, your booking system, your uh, bank. I interrupted you. Yeah, I, know, I got I know. excited on that VAT, that VAT answer. That you gave. Um, I use Mind Body Online, even though it's really expensive, but uh, I'm in it and it works. Um, I will, bank, you, will you change? You're not sure? You're going to stick with it? 
probably something that's more likely now because I have the time to sit down and organize the change for it to be smooth and successful rather than just doing it because I know it's going to be a little bit cheaper and creating my own headache. Um, I bank with NatWest. Um, what were the other questions? Uh, what merchant account is connected to MindBody Online? Uh, I do, I think, through GoCardless because the MindBody merchant account is ridiculously expensive. I use that now because I'm remotely, so for our onboarding or our, or our upfront fees, I will sell over the phone through the MindBody. I think they use NetBanks. Um, but our monthly recurring is all through go cardless. It's not a smoother or seamless process, as I know there are other operators li who link the two together. But it works, and I'm very familiar with it, which so it, so it works. Um, and you asked about two businesses. I do actually have another business. I run the Level 3 Training Academy as well, which was a godsend in the middle of coronavirus because we could be open for education but closed for gym. And it was something that kind of goes back in the the, the idea of where I wanted to go the life cycle of creating a business. I've really gone way off topic here, but um, actually employing people is one of the biggest things that's had a massive difference on my business. How many people do you have on the team? Five. And is it Ben that is, he, he's the gym manager now? Ben's studio manager, yeah. And, and how long has he been in that role for, or, or just been in the business for? So he must be two, two and a half years now. And is he the kind of right hand man to the situation 100%, 100%. now um, so many gyms always have that person in the business or that foundational staff member who kind of runs a lot of the day to day that you've been able to move out of what what have you done to be able to get him to that level and I'm sure there's still stuff that needs to be worked on and still needs to be uh, nurtured and improved but um, it's hard to find that person that you can really trust with the business um, you know there's so many horror stories of people leaving stealing clients how have you um, taken this person, gotten him to buy into the vision and gotten him to maybe feel like the business is a little bit of his own? I've uh, been there, had that before. People walk away with clients. It's the, um, again, it, being a trainer and having a, you know, uh, uh, you know, someone do a couple of sessions and borrow your space for a couple of quid uh, is so different to trying to employ a team member. And it felt very risky previously. But actually, if you buy in on them, the buy I've found that the buy-in in return is huge. They've got security. You don't get that in the fitness industry. They're going to get paid the same at the end of the month, whether they train one person a week or 25 people a week. You don't get that in the fitness industry. Um, I think we have a nice environment to work in. So we're not in the traditional gym sharky. You know, if you've gone holiday for a week and you, your your competitor in the in the commercial gym is all over your client trying to get them to to train with them. We're a team, so if if Ben was away, then if him, his members want sessions, we will try and organise them with Jamie or Hannah or somebody else. If they if they don't want those sessions, then then that's fine. Um, so actually, the, the, the biggest change was was employing people, and then when it comes to Ben, it's the it's the vision. He's it's the employing good people my team might hate this, and maybe not employing good personal trainers because we can teach them that. We can't teach them to be good humans. It's still a gamble, but if you can get a really good person, which Ben is and which everybody in my team are, we can help them become really good trainers. Yeah, you have you know an amazing practitioner who knows absolutely everything, but if they've got a really bad personality or aren't personable, um, it's just not going to be a good fit. That's no easy life. You can't move to Ireland if you've got that because they're just going to create stress and hassle for you. What were the hesitations to getting full-time staff and having them as a employee rather than a contractor? Because being a contractor has its, uh, I would say, short-term perks, as in you can make a bit of money off them. You don't have to um, give them holiday or sick pay or anything like that. You're kind of quite disconnected to them quite easily. Um, so you don't, basically just don't really give a shit about them, I, I think. I think it's just so, like, when I hear gyms, again, like on paper, they preach that they're so successful. And then you ask them that question, are your staff on payroll or are they contractors? And then they go, oh yeah, they're all contractors. And I just know like- there's You don't more... give a shit. Well, first of all, you don't says. give a shit and there's more cracks in your business than you think there is. Yeah, I know a gym near me and it's full of personal trainers that rent the space. And I know that two of them are opening a facility right around the corner from that place. And the reason they're doing it is, it, you know, why wouldn't they? Because what, what what have you given to them in terms of loyalty if you're just charging them to use the space and you're not treating them like a team member, they're not bought into the vision, they're going to follow their own path. I call that easy money. So 
there was a time in our business where that was the right thing to do. At the very beginning, you know, an old trainer that I knew, he had 10 clients who wanted to come over and rent some space. That, that, that was easy money. Take a tenner an hour for him. He turned up, trained his clients, and he walked off again. Um, but you will get bitten, and there's no there's no long game in that, and they know that as much so as as much as you know that. But when you when that what I said, when you buy into them, the buying in return has been way more than than what I've ever paid anybody to do that. And I would love to grow my business to be able to pay my staff members. And, and our vision is, or my vision to them is, I would like you to be the highest paid personal trainers in our area, um, so they never, so that they don't have to worry about money or they don't have to worry about they they can achieve their dreams they can just be really good coaches and focus on that and as we grow as a business like for ben we, we he's forced me to grow because if i don't create something for him he's gonna leave because he's got his own aspirations and we are only small so we haven't got multiple roles to, for people to move into and move over to finance move over to operations move over somewhere else what are, what are his day to day? so th does he still coach yeah, Ben's still coaching. Yeah, then, maybe 50, ten to fifteen hours a week. Okay, maybe a little bit of holiday cover, depending on on, on what the week. So he's still is. doing a little bit of coaching. Then what are those other hours spent doing? So the other hours is going to be it's very operational. So he would be sitting down watching and reviewing sessions. And again, what, it's really good how doing this podcast for me because it's really good to look back back and see how far you've come. You don't when you've got too many clients beyond yourself, and your mate comes over and trains them, and you give them twenty quid for it. You're never going to sit in and watch your session and, and critique him. But when you're employing staff, it needs to be delivered in a particular way. Um, so he will be sitting down, watching sessions and scoring them on a score sheet and giving them that, that feedback. It's, it's interesting what you say. So it's, it's actually better for the client um, if you're employing your staff because you now care about the quality of what's happening bet uh, bet uh, in between those four walls. If it's a contract and they rent a space, you don't really care about what's going on because it's not really your client but it's still within your walls, it's still within your brand. So they may associate that experience to your gym because the person, the consumer doesn't actually understand that that person's a contractor. Because what will happen a lot of the time is uh, a lead will come to a gym, the gym goes to the personal trainer, hey, I've got this person for you to train. Um, I'll take X amount, you take the rest. And now the experience is associated with that person. But again, because you've got that disconnect, they're not really an employee, you're not actually too fussed about their training ethos. So it's better for the consumer to have an employee and it's as well. awkward or hard. we're gonna have a team meeting or do I get paid for that team meeting or not if I'm a contractor? It's like we have team meetings twice a week. We don't always do all of them because we don't need to, but we allocate that time. And if they if we don't use that time, they've got other things they can go and, and, and get on with in their own time. Well, I think a good way to look at it is imagine Nando's or any high street uh, restaurant just uh, you know had contractors on the grill cooking whatever they fancied and <laughs> delivering whatever yeah. they wanted that yeah. day like they wouldn't be able to scale that business but Nando's I'm sure has full-time staff who go through staff training attend staff meetings follow staff protocol wear staff uniform and cook what Nando's want them to cook and it's the same as running a gym and having a personal training business you control the quality of the product that gets served on the gym floor which is the restaurant space yeah i think that's the e-myth of the or, or like i say like ronald mcdonald isn't flipping your but if it isn't flipping the burgers right but he's he's top of the tree he had they had to do that at the very start and they had to figure out the perfect layout if you watch the movie i don't have them really good uh, it's, film. it's a great yeah, film the founder. How, how they got it out onto the tennis court and they and they moved it all around oh you're gonna what's the movie because you, you i have a spin really there. bad attention span. Oh, i've I'm told you this a few times oh, no. it's, it's called the founder it's, it's really good about the guy who finds McDonald's so it exists it's not actually his Bef yeah it's before not, he no. scales it it exists but the thing that was really magical was the system that these brothers had created um, in terms of the service the delivery in comparison to any other restaurant that was there at that time and he fell in love with that system and he took that and he scaled it globally so he didn't actually create the system but he found it and it was that it's that system that has made McDonald's what it is today. It's not necessarily the taste of the food because it's it's the manner and the system of how that's all it's, delivered. It's the operations. And you get the same together. burger in Paris as you get in London. You get in New York. There's there's a mar very marginal difference between the whole lot. Which, if you think about, you know, large scale business, they're they're one of the ultimate in term in terms yeah. of, and of that. We're on a fitness podcast, and people might be like, "Oh, McDonald's is crap <laughs> food," but actually, no, it's consistent food. You know what you pay for, and you get it. You know every exactly single what you're going to get. And that's what you should be looking to do with your service. People walk in and they know what they're going to get because you have created that system. So the movie's called Founder. Yeah. And what channel? Um, I'm not sure. Go on like Amazon no, Prime, Prime, maybe. Prime or Netflix. Yeah, something like, like that. There. Yeah. It's good though. I'll check it out. Let's talk about sales, sales process. What did you used to do previously and what do you do now? Wing it. 
previously. <laughs> Still do a good bit of that now, but um, previously was uh, there. There was the sales process was all in here, and this is the stage that we're getting to. There's pl there's plenty of it still in here in my brain, um, uh, uh, and but it's starting to come out on on paper. Um, so before I was winging it, now uh, is very much following uh, a modified script from what you. I had a script before. I just didn't know it. it wasn't written down. I now have a modified script that I use over the phone uh, with Luke's coaching. I now I do a lot of one call closes. And uh, I think I answered a question recently in the group about this. That isn't our only option. So we do one call close. If I can't get one call close, I'll book a consultation. If I can't get a consultation, then, you know, like it, it scaled and works its way all the way down to maybe they're just not a good fit or they're not going to buy. And what you're doing is you're removing the barriers for purchase because some people would do a call and they have to come for a consultation, but some people are probably ready to sign up there and then. So why well, are you I'm not a one call close. Down? I don't know if you remember, Charlie, but nobody, oh, clo yeah, nobody yeah, closed yeah. me on the phone. I did the annoying walk away. Yeah. Even though I knew that I wanted it and I was going to do it, I just wanted to sleep on it. But to with to join when, to join when FMA, you join FMA. To join oh, FMA. you're one of those. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But. So I so I have empathy with the person who doesn't want to give me 460 quid over the phone. They've never been to us. They just saw a Facebook advert. So did Charlie sell you into FMA? I think so. Yeah, it might, it might I think I spoke me. with you first, and then and then and then we got passed over. But yeah. but, 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 bad, but bad cop, good cop. Yeah. <laughs> but can you imagine like if you went on that call and then we only did a one call close? You would have then, uh, yeah, 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 that's it. And there would be a number of people that didn't come because you need to change the process for the person that you're speaking to. But you should always go for the one call close in like a in like a nice 100%. way. Um, and then if there's a logistical objection, you can overcome that, get them in. But if some, as you just said, they've seen an ad, you've called them, and they're trying to get four hundred and sixty pounds for personal training over the phone. Yeah, that's fair enough. They want to come in and the, see the premises. The process has been perfect. You feel like you've got the, you sound like the perfect member is going to fit in exactly. Yeah. And they just stumble on the, that, well, that's okay. Just come on Tuesday and we'll get it yeah. all done. So, and, and our attendance rate for that is, is pretty high. Yeah, it's just that most people will probably buy on a one call close. Some people will want a consultation and that little bit of reassurance, but always kind of prioritize the easiest route with least resistance is what I'd say. But just, start at the top, have yeah, the confidence to start at the top, which I wasn't doing before. It was always consultation, no show, consultation sign. I always knew if I got someone in front of me, I never measured it. Something we need to, we, we do measure more now is that if I got someone to a consultation, I was pretty confident I was going to close them. If they're going to bother to come in, like they're in. But it actually, the initial FMA, that was my only process. It was phone them, get them to come in, and it was a lot of no-shows. Whereas now it is phone them, one call close, if not And And, and the reason there's so many no-shows with a consultation is because when they're speaking to you on the phone and they are accepting the offer to come to the consultation, they may be genuinely excited to come at that point in time because of the process that you've taken in place to find out about them and show them how you can help them. But then what happens is, is two, three days pass and loads of things can happen in that time. They have a bad day at work. They start having negative thoughts about, oh, what if I'm the biggest, the slowest, the sweatiest? What if I don't look good in my gym gear? All these fears build up and then they no-show because they don't- Change is uncomfortable. Yeah, that's it. So you need to be able to essentially strike while the iron is hot. So if you are going to go for a consultation, try and do that as quickly as possible. But that's why we do like the one call close because if they're ready to go, let's get them signed let's get up. Them in. That's, that's been a, a game changer, particularly to be able to run it remote. So my team aren't sat at the studio waiting for someone who's not going to turn up you're just, just wasting hours they're so unproductive your mindset is off and i'm sure you still do a consultation when someone signs up so like if they're on the phone you'll still do the consultation process it's exactly right? the same session some have paid for that session in advance and it's uh or in the semi-private we call it an onboarding session we just yeah. change the language an onboarding or a consultation what happens in that session apart from the close at the end is identical and that's, yeah, so people have had um, concerns about moving to the one call close and they say, oh, but I've got this really great consultation process. It's 90 minutes long and it's just really valuable. It's like, well, if it's so valuable, do it after they've paid you. They're charging for it. Because if you're going to do it for free, it's actually, you're, it's, there's less perceived value for it because they haven't paid you a penny. Whereas once they've paid and they go through these steps, they will value every process, acknowledge the information even more than they would if they didn't pay for it. Or oh, I missed a step in the, like, that process is one call close, paid consultation, free consultation. Yeah. Call, call them back tomorrow, or, or call them back for one call close yeah, tomorrow. Do a, a two call close, free or... trial. Um, no, no, I hate that as well. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I hate that. Like three two week trial. Yeah, no. What is your front end offer typically? Right now is a six week summer shape up, which we never do. But do you change it um, now and then? Because so you said right now, so on, it is sometimes it's a thirty your, day. Or... Yeah, on your advice, I've gone for the six week for a different offering. You know, different people, different locations, different offer. Normally we do twelve weeks. We sign everyone into a minimum three month membership. And then it's a rolling monthly contract off the back of that. So 
I haven't got the time or the energy. We haven't got the space and it wouldn't work in our facility to onboard, have 20 or 30 or 40 new trialists and just for them all to come in and just disappear again. It just, it just seems like a backwards model to me. Let's get one person and make sure that they're a perfect fit and make sure that they try and turn them into a lifetimer and then let's do the same with the next person and the same with the next person. You know, we don't do it with everybody, of course, but let's let's actually focus on that one rather than the, the 20 on our two-week trial. That well, what we've seen never gonna stay. common uh, recently is a lot of uh, business models similar to yourself, small group training. They will do a, a group consultation in person or on Zoom and then just get 20 people in a room. They know they've got 50% close rate, so they'll get close 10 of them and then onboard those 10 people at once. And then what happens is, well, eight, you know, leave and, and two stick. And just get, people just get lost. It's hard to, yeah. hard to track, hard to and manage. And that trap, right, of just, oh, I need all these leads. I need yeah. all these sales. I think people get it mistaken because, like, you people, people want to get customers to make sales, but it's the other way around. You make sales to get customers. And once you've got that customer... Like how long can you create lifetime value with that person? That's what the purpose of marketing is to get customers. So if we ever do a front end offer, whether it's a six week, a 12 week, a 30 day, it's to get a customer and for that customer to love us and stay for as long as possible because that's where the real growth comes in is getting that customer and keeping them for as long as possible. But so many people just focus on the sales, like bringing people in, bringing people in, when actually you bring people in to serve. That is the main objective of everything that you're doing. And if you bring too many in, then you can't serve them more appropriately, in, in my opinion, on my experience. And maybe the, like, the floor plan you know, is small for us, but, but I'd much rather do that that way and maybe... It's a slow. It's, a, it's been a slower game. I probably could have been where I am faster if we ad adapted a, a different model. But I'm not. I'm not convinced it would suit me well or would be the best thing for our business. Two quick fire questions before we go ahead and wrap things up. So first of all, if you go back in time, start all over again, but knew the destination you wanted to get to, which is right now, what would you have done differently? I think the answer is uh, get help sooner from the right people in in and around your industry, and and then and take and take immediate action, and and, and pro procrastinate less about the the right what the right thing to do is. Go and get help from like having a coach, right? Like having a trainer. It's not my area of expertise, same as it's not someone's fitness journey. And then um, you'll be able to push on faster. There's no one I can think of that is successful, I think, in any industry that didn't have help from someone else. Like No one just figured things out on their own, right? Like Impossible. Everyone gets help from someone who has either done it or done it in a different way to be able to get their experience on board. Last question, and I'm, you, I usually tell people this before so they can have a little think about it, so I haven't done this today, so I do apologise. If you were Prime Minister for a day and could make a change in the fitness industry or the overall population to make people fitter, healthier, happier, or just improve the fitness industry. You can make one change, change one law or anything like that. What would that change be? Great question. I would go back to the start of my love for sport. So I would make exercise compulsory for children as a main, like turn up at school, do an hour of exercise, get on with your day. And I think that's a habit that would then be installed in the UK that would yield unbelievable benefits exercise is like a drug right if everyone if exercise was a pill then everyone would be we'd be addicted to it in the uk but it's not it's hard work and, and we're, we're not too familiar with it but if we made the younger generation really familiar not the sporty ones we did, we did exercise not always sport if we made everybody do exercise from a really young age i think it would make it would yield huge dividends in 20 30 40 50 100 years time it's interesting in the UK, um, like within the government, um, you have art, culture, and sport. So they're all placed together in the same section. In the Netherlands, you have health and sport. So like where sport is placed in the same category as the healthcare system in there. So it's taken far more seriously and kind of put into that category rather than almost like a luxury category when it comes into art, culture and sport there. So it's, it has I that. I didn't know you had an insight into European politics. Yeah, so no, quite... I, listen, I listened to it on a podcast. Yeah, so <laughs> I heard that the other day, actually. Well, it's quite interesting, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's like, so, and the reason, the, the, the reason they do that is because their healthcare system is a... Uh, Everyone pays like similar to the national insurance, but the government will pay an like, like an insurance policy if someone goes to a hospital. So basically what that means is that the government has to focus on prevention so much more because they don't want to pay out for the insurance quote. If, if that, so by having sport in there, it encourages people to be active and has prevention. We're just there. putting a sticky plaster on the problem that we have in the UK right now, right? We're helping people lose weight and helping them feel better, look better, you know, mental health, physical health. 
Um, but, but wouldn't it be great, like you just said, that in the prevention model, I would, I would love to do or see something in that prevention model of significant change in the future rather than becoming overweight, becoming out of shape, not exercising for, you know, people will say, oh, yeah, yeah, not that long ago, I used to be fit. You know, well, when we get into the not that long, it's like 10 years ago. You know, the last time I worked out was five. I played football once. Yeah. Um, that, that we could really do some damage on that on that prevention. And I think it would solve a whole world of problems that, that the UK and, you know, uh, America that have. I said the fitness industry is almost in a good spot because there's so many people that have problems that need to be solved. But wouldn't it be great if those problems weren't there in the first place, 100%. right? And we had that prevention in place. Might not be great for business, but I yeah. think for the long term, you know, the prime minister type question, I think I'd love to see that as a priority. Um, thank you for coming to the podcast studio. Um, it's been a pleasure to speak to you today and see the journey that you've been on uh, with FMA for the three plus years that you've been a member, a client of ours. And, uh, you know, you're a true business owner and, you know, testament to yourself. You said it in the podcast earlier. It's good coming here because you've been able to sort of talk about your story and what you've actually built. So, you know, credit to you, you know, give yourself a, a pat on the back. Um, I think uh, a lot of FMA clients will listen or watch this podcast and be inspired by your story and what you've achieved and then other people inside the fitness industry as well. You've been an amazing client for us and continue to be. And um, the fact that you've moved to Ireland, relocated your family and the business is still running successfully is a testament to your hard work. So uh, thank you, Gareth. Well, thank you in return as well. I uh, definitely wouldn't be here without uh, your help. So I really appreciate that. Thanks for listening to the Fitness Marks and Agency podcast. If you enjoyed it, make sure to subscribe so you can catch future episodes.